Wow, what a hard act to follow. Where, where's Leo now? Is he, he's gone off to have a bathroom break? So there he is at the back, Leo. Thank you so much. That was great. Can I get you to come to all my sessions and sort of be my leader? Because I, basically my keynote presentation has already been presented. He pretty much has done all the main messaging that I'm going to be giving to you. I'll be giving you from a slightly different perspective from someone who's been in the education world for, you're not going to believe this, I've been a teacher for, ready to look shocked and horror, 23 years. Horror, shock, horror. No, oh, come on, please. So, um, yeah, 23 years, uh, five of those years was actually as a primary school teacher, teaching grade five, six, and grade four. And in one of those years, Leo reminded me of uh, a time when I was teaching a grade five class and a student teacher came up to me and said, Tim, let me show you something that I've learnt at uh, university just recently. This is called HTML. So, what's, what's that? What's it mean? Okay, this was back in 1997. The internet was very young. I hadn't heard of HTML. I've obviously been on the internet at that time. Our school didn't have a website. And this, this uh, teacher, this, this student teacher said, well, this is how it works. And she showed me basically <coughs> how to set up a website with HTML coding. Now, back in those days, there were some very basic HTML editors around, but they were very hard to find and not easy to work with. So it was really interesting to go through the process of actually using the coding. It was my first real experience of actual coding to make a website. And I thought, this is amazing. Like, I, I remember at school learning basic. Who did basic at school? And it was taught by the maths and science department, and I absolutely hated it. In fact, I wrote a song when I was in year 10 called Technology, Let Me Be, Leave Me Alone. I don't want to live my life with you, I'd rather write a song. That's the title, it didn't rhyme, did it? That's why the song didn't actually make it to the top 40. But I, I, I realised at the time I wasn't really into technology as a student, and I, the way coding was taught to me it was just like, ah, oh, this is just so math, so science, it just wasn't for me. And yet, what Leo is saying is that every student should be learning how to code. And so back then, when I, in the 80s, when I was learning how to code, it was like, I just don't want to go there. This is just not for me. And it was a student teacher, 10 years later, that basically said to me, this is how it works. I thought, that's amazing. And it just worked. And so what I did from then on is I made sure that every one of my assignments that I gave my grade five class had the option of doing it in HTML. And I showed my grade five kids how to actually do this coding and got my student teacher to come and show them as well. And some of those kids were just went with it. And it was just brilliant to see the work that they were doing. And some of them then uh, have now gone on to do IT careers and so on. And, and I wonder whether that was a bit of a stimulus for them, which was really terrific to, uh, to be able to be part of that. But what was, um, what was interesting is at the time, all the teachers that I was working with, this was a big private school in Melbourne that I was a primary school teacher at. I was one of many grade five teachers. It's a big school. And uh, they were looking at what I was doing and saying, you can't do this. This is just not right. The curriculum says you're supposed to be doing a poster. <laughs> oh, okay. Even the, I, I even had a, a sit down with the principal. And the principal said, look, you realise the things that you're doing, the other teachers can't do, so don't do them. <laughs> really? And I had to sort of sit back, and I was a young teacher at that time, and I was very impressionable, and I was listening to my leaders, and finally I realised, well, okay, maybe this teaching thing isn't for me. Maybe I shouldn't be a teacher. And eventually, I, I, I started out as a primary school teacher. I started training. My first degree was in primary teaching, did a diploma of teaching primary at Victoria College Burwood. Hands up, Victoria College Burwood people! <laughs> Two of you, three of you. <laughs> it became Deakin University. Hands up, Deakin University people! There we go. I am that old, aren't I? And um, it, was, uh, it was interesting to see that, that I was being pushed away from teaching. I was being pushed away from finding something that I thought, this is really creative. This is something that I'm beginning to develop a bit of a passion for. And I actually built the school's first website with this knowledge. And I developed, I learned how to use front page as it was. Microsoft had this HTML editor back there called front page. And I started learning how to, how to uh, 
compressed images and Photoshop in its very early days. I started working with those. I developed a real interest in IT. And I, I started using it in my classes, as I mentioned before. And then my teachers, my, my heads of uh, department and, uh, and so on, said, look, it's probably, primary teaching is probably not for you. You probably need to look elsewhere. And so I did. And I ended up having to move out of primary school and became an IT teacher at a secondary school. And had to learn, literally, there was one year where I was teaching a grade five class and halfway through the year, I moved to another school as an IT teacher at year 12 level. And I had to learn all this stuff. So I, I'd done my, I was doing my masters at that particular time. So I was learning um, at, at university. But then to actually go and teach IT at this very senior level, again, I was having the same issue. You have to follow the curriculum. You have to follow the VCE. There are so many things you have to do. And so the curriculum was driving what I wanted to do. But in fact, what I really wanted to do was get the kids to be creative and to learn. So I really enjoyed doing that when I had my junior classes, but I couldn't in my senior classes. And then I decided to sort of change the philosophy of, of that whole mentality. And what I decided to do was every time I had a, a work piece, even for VCE in year, te year 11 and 12, I would say, let's see if we can add something to this called the X factor. You've got this set criteria you have to follow, sure. You've got to meet all those things, but I'm going to give you some extra marks or the X factor. And some of the kids, what, what is it, what do I do? The X factor, the way I grade the X factor is how many hairs on the back of my neck stand up when I look at your work. Wow. Some of the kids just go, this is really cool. I'm just gonna go and gonna make the best thing I possibly can. They'll spend hours on it and they'll just use their creativity so that they can get the, just those extra few marks that I put in for the X factor. Some of the kids are, how am I gonna get an A plus? How do I get, how do I give you my X factor? Like, it just, it just didn't get, that just didn't get it at all. So it was really interesting to be able to try and be creative within a structure that is not creative. And it's interesting how we look at how the schools have been developed over many years. Schools were not designed to be creative. And I'll touch on that in just a minute. So let me just introduce myself a little bit more. I'm also the vice president of, D, one of the vice presidents of DLTV, Digital Learning and Teaching Victoria. Hands up if you've heard of DLTV. Great, I can see some hands up. Hands up if you've heard of ICTV, ICTV. Hands up if you've heard of VITA. All right, ICTV and VITA are now DLTV. They've merged together. This is the, the largest ICT Teachers Professional Association in the country, and it's here in Victoria. And we encourage you, if not your schools to be members if they're not already, to make sure your school is a member of this group. But also for you individually to consider being a member of this particular group as well. And there's a lot of things you can do uh, with this group. As you can see, there's a lot of advantages of being part of a, a teacher's professional organisation that encourages creativity, that encourages professional learning of ICT in education. Mark Richardson's over there. Give us a wave. Mark, stand up, Mark. There he is. He works for DLTV and he's a good man to come and talk to at some point if you're interested in talking to him. We've got a booth? Yeah, a booth. Even better. There you go. Special deal for you guys. So that's, uh, that's one hat that I'm sort of representing here. I wanted to make sure that was out there from the start and I encourage you. In fact, in my first year of teaching, I was actually... I started off as a primary teacher, but uh, back in the early 90s, Jeff Kennett was Premier and he was closing down schools left, right and centre. Who was teaching back then in the early 90s? And remember those days when the school, there were no jobs. I could not get a job as a primary school teacher. A male primary school teacher who had a music background, a music major at Victoria College Road, I could not get any work at all. So this private school called, guess what, Kingswood College. <laughs> So that's three Kingswoods I've been involved with now. That private school called King, and my dad drove a Kingswood too. <laughs> that's four Kingswoods I've been involved with. But Kingswood College, they, uh, I did a teaching round there in my last year of primary teaching and they liked, they liked who I was and so on, so they offered me a job as a music teacher. So my first five years of teaching was as, actually as a music teacher at Kingswood College. And uh, that was a great experience. And, um, uh, I'm trying to remember why I went there, but, uh, oh yeah, as a first year teacher, my, my director of music said, can you come with me to a teacher's professional association, this was a music teacher's professional association group, and I want you to talk to them about what you're doing in, the, in your music classes. 
what? I've just started this job. You want me to go and talk to a whole lot of teachers about what I'm doing, and I'm a first year out teacher? And he said, yes, I'm going to help you. I'm going to support you in this process. No. He said, yes, you are. And, and he, he brought me along. We had to do this presentation. And I was so nervous. I had no idea. But I learned so much in the process. Hands up if you're a first year out teacher. I've only got a smattering here. It's Okay, for those of you who are first year out teachers, if you get the opportunity to go and talk and present to other teachers, take it up. Because I learned so much. And that was a great experience for me to realise that I can actually probably actually <coughs> offer something in the education world, even as a young first year out teacher. And every year since then, since 1991, when I first started teaching, <coughs> I've been doing exactly that. that in coming to events like this and presenting to teachers like yourself. I've learned so much in the process to the point now where I've got this amazing opportunity to work for one of the biggest IT companies in the world. And uh, they, uh, I've, I've been doing this just over a year now and it's been incredible. I've literally, we did the numbers just recently. We look up all the social media interactions plus the face-to-face -face plus the webinars, all the online interactions. I've literally engaged in 12 months with over 100,000 educators worldwide with this particular opportunity. It has been an incredible opportunity to go and see what's happening. One of the highlights, as touched on before, was actually doing engagement at Disneyland. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. In fact, I met one of my heroes there. There she is. I had a bit of a chat with her too. I thought, um, she doesn't talk very much, but I tried to have a bit of it. It was a very one-way conversation. I said, look, uh, you and Mickey are you getting on, you know, because um, it was 1955, you kind of started getting together, and I don't think you've been married yet, have you? And she just looked at me, talked, smiled, nodded, thinking, okay, that's fine. I won't develop that any further. In fact, I think she's got a restraining order on me now, but that's okay, not to worry. <coughs> One of the things I want to suggest to you today, and this is what I try to do when we're doing these sorts of events, is get you to try and take on board as much as you can, but if you can follow up on just two things that you think really are hitting you, hitting home for you, do that follow up over the next week. There's some research that I was reading recently that says if you don't follow up these great ideas and things and concepts that you've been hearing within a week of hearing them, they're just going to go into the ether. You're not going to eventually actually follow them up and follow them. So there's a bit of homework for you to think about, following up at least two ideas. Make it two ideas from every session if you can. So right, you'll have lots of ideas, follow up two of them if you can. All my slides, by the way, if you're interested, everything that I present will be available on that link. So it's, it's a bit.ly link, and it's Kwood, as in Kingswood, Knote, as in Keynote. Kwood, Knote, Knote 14. So bit.ly slash Kwood, Knote 14. That'll come up again a little bit later too. I want to show you my favourite photo at the moment. That's uh, part of my family. My daughter, who's 13, her name is Talana, and she would absolutely hate it if she knew that she was up there in front of you guys, being a third, typical 13-year-old. In fact, she said to my wife last night, as we were having dinner, she said, Dad, said to me, you're really not as cool as I thought you were. <laughs> really? And then she turned to my wife and she said, Mum, you're really opinionated. <laughs> it's a little girl. I mean, she's got, who's got a 13 year old? Okay. Is that, happened? Is that normal? Yeah. Is that, is that, she was my beautiful little girl and now, now she's being opinionated. I don't know where that's coming from. But anyway. The, the main thing I wanted to show you with that photo is down the bottom left hand, right hand corner from you guys is my grandmother who's turning 94 on Sunday. Well, I hope she turns 94 on Sunday. I hope nothing happens between now and then, but 94 on Sunday and we're having a bit of a weekend celebration for her this weekend. And I asked her not so long ago, what was school like for her? I asked her, what was school like in the 1920s and the 1930s? And uh, she said, look, I only went to school up to year eight. I couldn't go any further than that because my dad said women weren't to be educated higher than primary school, but I was able to try and convince him to get me at least into two years of secondary school, and then I had to go and get a job. I said, okay, that's interesting. What was it like in the classrooms? What was it like for you? She goes, well, one thing that I remember is that when I first started uh, school, I was left-handed. And I used to grab the quill and the ink with my left hand, and before I even put it on the paper, the teacher would grab the ruler and smash my left hand. 
So you do not write left-handed. You write with your right hand. So she was forced to set that standard, to fit into that box, to actually conform to what the needs were. Schools were designed, back then even before her time, were designed to be institutionalised. They were designed to get as many people as you can through to get them into sort of factories. It was all the industrial revolution sort of stuff. Schools were designed not to be creative. Back in those days, schools were all about a teacher at the front of the room and rows of desks in the classroom. Gee, I'm glad that's changed now. I'm travelling around the world now with this job and I am seeing some changes, but it is slow. Most schools that I go to around Asia Pacific still have the teacher at the front of the room and the rows of desks and everything is kind of focused on the teacher. But I'm seeing changes. Every so often I'm going into schools and I'm actually seeing groups. And I'm actually seeing not a front of the room. I'm actually seeing not a focused, a teacher-centred approach. I'm actually seeing a collaborative approach in sections. I'm not seeing it all the time. But I am seeing the gradual change. I did have the opportunity to meet this man here. And uh, he, he was referred to by Leia. Thank you for referring to him. And uh, he was here at uh, Brisbane at Edutech. He was one of the keynote speakers. That's where I got a chance to actually meet him. In fact, I was his welcoming committee. Not officially, just happened to be that I was walking out of the hotel as he was coming in and I recognised him straight away. I thought, oh my goodness, my taxi driver was waiting for me, I was about to go and run a workshop. And I said, hold it guys, I just want to go and meet this man. And I, he opened the door and I said, Sir Ken, welcome to Australia. And he had a big smile on his face as if I was his official welcoming community. <laughs> and we had this long, long chat for about what well, felt like hours, but it was probably about two minutes. And then his son, James, who he talks about in that TED talk in 2006, which, by the way, is the most watched TED talk ever. So if you want to watch any one of those TED talks, look at the 2006 one. Sir Ken's done three TED talks. First one's the best one, in my opinion. The others are great too. But um, uh, his son James got out of the car and said, would you like a photo? I said, oh, absolutely. And, and I had that photo taken, which was another one of my favourite images. But I want to actually uh, introduce you to Sir Ken if you haven't heard of him. Hands up if you have not heard of Sir Ken. And I'm finding this a lot, that a lot of educators still haven't heard about this guy. And, and it gives me an opportunity to sort of share with you his philosophy, share with you what he's thinking. And you will hear more of him, uh, I'm sure, at these type of events. His book, Out of Our Minds, of which he's written a second version recently, I'm calling it The Teacher's <coughs> Bible. Especially the first half of it. Absolute gold. And if there's any one book that you should read over the next 12 months, make it this one. Out of Our Minds by Sir Ken Robinson. <coughs> and you will be absolutely inspired and will give you a really good idea of why this concept of creativity in education has become such a a term of thought leadership, such a term of controversy in some, some regards, but such an important part of education in the 21st century. In the book he says, helping people to connect with their personal creative capacities is the surest way to release the best they have to offer. I love that statement. I love what that brings out. To me, that's what education's about. To me, that's why I do what I do. That's why I did what I did every day in the classroom. Every time I walk into a classroom in front of a group of kids, it's an incredible privilege. It's an incredible responsibility. They are little sponges. And you have an influence on their lives, just like I did for that grade, those grade five kids back in 1997, whenever it was, to be able to give them a chance, an opportunity to be creative and maybe change their life in some way, in some small way. You, as an educator, have that responsibility and that privilege. And it is a big responsibility. Sir King did a series of videos with us at Adobe. And I just want to play this one. If you want to see the full set, just do a YouTube search for Sir Ken and Adobe, and the full set will come up for you. But I want you to have a listen to this one. I'll just make sure the audio is well and truly. That's the cue to bring it down and up. There we go.
There's an assumption that's often made, which is simply not true, when people think about education. And the assumption is that life is linear, that you can anticipate and foresee and predict uh, the lives that people will have. And, and that assumption shows itself in the way that the school curriculum is managed, how it's narrowed with certain disciplines that are thought to be more useful. It shows itself in the obsession with standardized testing, for example, where uh, all the emphasis is on conformity. And when you talk to politicians about why schools are like this currently, uh, often they'll say it's in the interest of the economy. This strikes me as very ironic, because if you speak to business leaders, uh, they say they want people who are creative, who can innovate, who can think differently, who can work in teams and who can communicate. But all the things which are not now being taught in schools that have to submit to these rather standardized programs and policies. So um, the economic imperative for creative is absolutely clear. There was a report published by IBM which was based on a survey of 3,000 CEOs around the world. And they're asked what their priorities are as they face the future. What are things that wake them up at night? And the thing that came out the top was creativity. They said, how do we run businesses that systematically promote creative thinking and creative achievement and innovation? And of course, they're now being uh, faced with a generation of students coming through from schools who haven't been encouraged to develop these abilities at all. So the economic imperative for teaching creative creativity systematically in schools, I think, has never been greater. Um, and that requires a transformation in the way the schools work, because they weren't designed to do it, so they have to be redesigned if they are to do it. Um, but there's a big cultural imperative here too, because the world is getting more complicated, it's getting more connected, it's becoming more challenging. And many of the challenges that we face collectively as a species are cultural as much as they are environmental. And finding ways to live together in the world that's become more nuanced, more interdependent, more dynamic, uh, more connected, uh, is really a task for education. And the third big reason, I think, to promote creativity in schools is personal. In the end, it's about people finding fulfillment in their own lives, lives that add up to something that had purpose and had meaning, and that people feel uh, are helping them find their own course in life, one that matters to them and to other people. And for all these reasons, creativity to me is not an option, it's an absolute necessity. <laughs> Creativity for me is not an option. It's an absolute necessity. That's just a taste. And every time I see that, I pick up something new as well. So I encourage you to re-listen to that too on YouTube or Adobe TV, where all those videos are on. Am I still on? Yeah, cool. Now, Bloom's Taxonomy is something that we have all taught when we were learning to become teachers. Back in 1956, we are taught how important it is to think beyond just the basic remembering of facts and figures, which is a base level area of, of Bloom's taxonomy, and bring it right up to the ultimate. And according to Bloom, the ultimate is creativity. And yet, we tend to be so focused at this base level of learning, with our standardised testing, with making sure we've, we've covered numeracy and literacy perfectly so we can do, do really well with our standardised testing approaches. And that seems to be a culture that uh, is not just here, it's a culture all around Asia Pacific. And of course, from my perspective, you know, I think um, working with Adobe stuff kind of helps you reach that sort of pinnacle. Of course, our, uh, our software is available in all those areas. I, I love this kind of pyramid here because it gives you examples of how ICT can help in all those areas. And uh, Adobe is, a, is, is the kind of a leader in the creative industries. It's the software of choice by creative professionals. And uh, so I'd like to bring it up there. I'll give you a little taste of how you can use the creative software that you probably already have on your computers that you don't even know you've got and how it can be used effectively in a minute. But when I was learning how to uh, become a teacher and, and uh, even while I was teaching, there was a lot of devel development of what we know about the brain. When I was learning, we were sort of taught there was a left side and there's a right side and you're either one or the other or a little bit of both, but you kind of prefer the one or the other. What we've learned now that that's not the case anymore. What we've learned now is a lot more complicated than that. It's nice to think to think that sort of it's that simple, but it's not. And in fact, what we're finding is that there are so many connections around that if you if you're stretching your creative side, it's going to be helping the other part of you as well. If you're working on the other part, it's going to be helping on your creative side. It's not as simple as saying you're either creative or you're not. And as Leo said, he believes everyone can be creative. To a certain point. It's not just him. 
I've met Laos all over Asia Pacific. And a lot of them will come up to me and they'll say, Dr. Kitchen, I love coding, but my teacher won't let me do it because it's not on the criteria sheet. In fact, I was going to ask Leo a question with that um, eyeball thing that you did there. Did you pass that uh, test? Did you actually get a good mark for it? Yeah. yeah good. I did. I'm glad. Because uh, a lot of teachers will say, no, what you said was you meant to do a poster. You didn't do a poster. It was on the criteria poster. Sorry. You're getting an 80%, not 100 you know, and that is kind of the framework that we've kind of been living with and having to cope with. Interesting, when you look at some of the most ingenious people that we've ever come across in the 21st century, this man often comes up as one of them, Albert Einstein. What we found with him is that he spent a lot of time in his creative mode. So he's a great example of someone who has achieved some of the most great scientific breakthroughs in the 21st century, and yet he was a musician. In fact, he said, I am enough of an artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination is circles of the world. Now, that's, that's really profound. Now, I'll do a little bit more research on other people who are kind of both sides of the brain, if you want to say, if you want to look at it in that perspective. And Brian May, lead guitarist of Queen, PhD in astrophysics. How <laughs> cool. So at Adobe, we do a fair bit of research each year on this concept of creativity. And most recently, in April this year, we did a study of, uh, it was about 1,500 educators in the Asia Pacific region. And we asked them questions about why is creativity important? And we had almost unanimous results. Creative, creative expression is a must. 97% agree that creative tools actually help students in the learning process. OK, that's interesting. Creative tools enhance students' conceptual understanding of what they're doing. So if it's a teacher talking, you're going to be covering about 10% of your class with the way they learn it. 10% of your class will learn that way. Only 10%. And an interesting fact, I do a lot of video production. I work with a lot of video and media producers. Their rule of thumb is seven seconds. If you've got an edit, or if someone is talking, for seven seconds, if you don't change something about the screen at that point in time, you're going to lose your audience. I'm just going to go through this quickly. Flash is animation. Illustrator is making, making vector diagrams so that you can actually make a diagram or make a logo or something, and then you can scale it huge, and it doesn't lose any quality. That's pretty cool. Because you know with JPEGs, you sort of make them with Photoshop or something. You scale them up, and they sort of go pixelated. Not with... Um, not with Illustrator. In fact, I think it was 90% of the logos that you see around the world were made with Illustrator. That was, that was a stat I heard recently. InDesign is our desktop publishing solution, and uh, that would be a great alternative to Microsoft Publisher. But InDesign is the industry standard. In fact, I've heard another stat. It was 85% of all magazines around the world are actually made with InDesign. And it has now a whole app side of it, digital publishing solution. So if you want to make an app, without needing to know too much coding, you can use InDesign, and it does all this app development for you, for not just the iPad, but also for Android devices and for Windows 8. So it's a, a terrific tool to be aware of. Adobe Muse is our web design tool now. Again, you don't need to know much coding. I'm saying that a lot, aren't I? I'm kind of contradicting, but Dreamweaver is kind of more for coding. Muse is, is, is uh, more for designers, I suppose. Photoshop, everyone knows Photoshop, the industry standard, but it's also Photoshop Elements, which is a cut-down version that a lot of primary schools are using because they think Photoshop is just too big and too awesome. But Photoshop Elements is great. But I'm finding that kids from about grade four up are saying, I'd rather use Photoshop. So they'd actually rather use the really cool tools that are part of Photoshop. Photoshop Touch is the, the, um, the tablet version of Photoshop. Premiere Elements is our video editing package at a basic level. So it's a cut down version of Premiere Pro. It does some really cool things that some of you might already have on your computers. Premiere Pro is now, the industry standard video editing package is taken over from Apple's Final Cut since Final Cut Pro X came out. This is the coolest video <coughs> editing package that uh, is available to, um, to anyone that's being used around the world. In fact, everything that you saw in the World Cup soccer was all done with Premiere Pro. SBS have now adopted <coughs> Premiere Pro as their main package for for everything they do. Presenter is, uh, I'm doing a workshop on Presenter. It's a great way of capturing the screen, great way of capturing voice, capturing images, 
and putting together some e-learning modules. And Adobe Voice, well, uh, I'm not going to get time, I might get time to give you a quick little demo, but it's an app that I've been part of the development. So Leo showed you his app, I'm going to show you my, my app, Adobe Voice. Who's actually got Adobe Voice, seen it, heard it? I think a handful, so I'd love to show it to you. I'm going to do a little <coughs> workshop on Adobe Voice a little bit later on. But it's the simplest way, and it's, and it's free. It doesn't cost a cent. Is yours free? Uh -huh. Mine's free. <laughs> and it's, um, it's the simplest way to, um, uh, to do a multimedia presentation with voiceover, with images, and with text, and animations sort of built into it as well. So it doesn't include video in this case. There's something else coming out later with video. I'm not allowed to tell you that. Um, and Adobe Photoshop Mix is our free touch Photoshop uh, thing, which I haven't played with a lot yet. So there's so many things that you can work with in terms of enhancing creativity. I've probably totally overwhelmed you at the moment with what's out there and what you can potentially do to enhance creativity. So the biggest takeaway I want you to take away today is this resource here. Hands up if you've heard of this resource. Just give me a... Give me a Indication. All right, I'm finding that in Victoria, I'm finding that it's a minority of people have heard of it. 145,000 educators are on this resource. In fact, I did a screenshot just last night. 1,145,311 members. I'm hoping by the end of today, it'll be 145,600 because all of you guys are going to join this. This is brilliant. There are over six and a half thousand resources on this free portal that help you engage with all that software that you've already got on your computers, but you're not quite sure how to use it. So it's lesson plans, it's video <coughs> tutorials, it's teachers helping teachers. And a lot of those 145,000 educators will have a great idea that they've done in the classroom and they'll quickly post it onto the EdExchange and they'll give, sort of share their ideas on how it works. It's all creative commons, it's all sharing, and it's terrific. A lot of discussions that go on, and a lot of our professional development opportunities are advertised through the Education Exchange. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant portal. Highly recommend to join it. It doesn't cost a cent. I mentioned Adobe Voice before, and I've only got 10 minutes. I'm just going to do a really quick, really quick demo of how this works. So I'm going to... Plug, unplug and plug. I'm going to unplug audio too, by the way, up the back there. Are you ready? No, nope, wasn't ready. You might want to kill the audio on that just for a sec. Now, it could have been really cool and used uh, the same technology that Leo used and did this wirelessly, but I found with Adobe Voice it actually doesn't work as well when you're on the Wi-Fi or, or Bluetooth. I have to actually do it and connect. So I'm just plugging in and I'm just going to Adobe Voice. Now, let me show you how cool this is when it comes up. It's all about storytelling. And stories are a fundamental part of just about every subject that we teach in terms of telling stories. I'm going to create a new story. I'm just going to give it a title. I'm going to call it uh, Kingsworth. Click Next. And I'll just uh, plug the audio in so we get that hung off. And from here, you can actually choose what style of story you might want to be telling. Growth moment, teach a lesson, share an invitation, make up my own, tell what happened. Let's make up my own. I'm going to click that, pick this one. And it sets up a series of slides. Oh, in fact, I might go back and choose one that's like promote an idea because it's really cool. It actually gives you some guides. It sort of says, describe the world today. What's the setting or context of your story? Or show who you're helping. So it gives you a guide through the storytelling process. If you want to follow it, you don't have to, of course. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click on that little orange button, which doesn't look orange over there, but it does here. I'll click on that, go to the microphone, and I'm going to start my voiceover. Hi, I'm at Kingswood Primary School teaching a bunch of teachers about creativity. So let go, and let's just have a little listen to see how that, if that's worked. Hi, I'm at Kingswood Primary School teaching a bunch of teachers about creativity. Notice the voiceovers there and the music's instantly in the background, but the music was terrible. So what I'm going to do is go up to where it says music up the top, and there's a whole range of Creative Commons royalty-free music that you can choose from. Let's have a listen to this one. Oh yeah, I like that. That's good. Alright, so let's do that one again. Hi, I'm at Kingswood Primary School, teaching a bunch of teachers. Okay, I like it. So now what I can do is if I click icon, 
I can now search for a school or search for any topic at all. And what it does, it goes to the World Wide Web of all the royalty-free icons that are out there on the World Wide Web. And it starts picking them all up. And you try and choose one that you think is going to be appropriate. Hey, a really nice teacher-centered one there. It's coming up now. And if I go to my... Come on, wake up. If I go to my layout section, I can then decide maybe I'll have a little caption underneath as well. I'll just type in Kingswood. Okay. It's done. Nice and simple. And if I just... Uh, I'm not happy with the theme. I'm going to go up to my themes and maybe choose a different type of look. Let's go for chalk because it's a school theme. And we still use chalk, don't we? Hi, I'm at Kingswood Primary School teaching a bunch of teachers about creativity. Now, let's go to my next slide. And I'm not going to delete it. I'm just going to, it goes to my next slide. I'm going to say something like, these guys are really cool teachers. Now, instead of typing in cool teachers, I'm going to go to the photo section and click take a picture. Guess what, guys? <laughs> Give us a big smile, uh, put your thumbs up too, and look really cool. One, two, three. Excellent. Good. Use that photo. And as it comes up, I'm just going to make it a full screen. Go to my layout, full screen, so we can see it all there. And let's go to the next slide, just to save time. And I want you to help me with this next slide. I'm going to count to three, and I want you to say, we are really cool teachers. <laughs> Ready? One, two, three. We are really cool teachers. Okay. Now, if I uh, jump into the photo section again, I'm going to take another picture, and I want you to put your hands in the air this time, uh, because that's a cool thing to do. <laughs> Ready? So, hands in the air, hands in the air! Okay, here's a photo. All right, I'm not going to finish the story, but let's have a little play and just see what our story is like. Make that full screen again. Theme, layout, full screen, beautiful. Hi, I'm at Kingswood Primary School teaching a bunch of teachers about creativity. These guys are really cool teachers. Well done. I think you deserve a round of applause for that. Once you finish your story, it has those little credits that come up. You can put the names of the kids and so on in there. And it um, allows you to then to share it out. Now, it is a cloud-based technology, so it doesn't store the video on the iPad. What it does is that it stores it like YouTube and Vimeo. It stores it on a server and you get a link. But you can choose whether that's private or public. First thing you get to choose, and most teachers will choose, just plugging back in again. Okay. And uh, if you chose private, then only you would see that link and you can email it out. It does link to Facebook and Twitter, and you've got all those options as well in terms of sharing out your story. Or if you, don't want to, if you want to avoid the cloud totally, you can just literally play it from, from your iPad and so on. So there's lots of options there, but the workshop that I've got later on today will um, give you a little bit more on that. Let's uh, just finish up. How are we going for time? Three minutes. I want to introduce you to someone else who was a big change for me in terms of my concepts of creativity and education. That's Seymour Papert. Hands up if you've heard of Seymour Papert. Look him up. He's the godfather of ICT and education. <coughs> Seymour Papert worked with Dr. Alan Kay to invent this concept of mobile computing back at MIT at Boston University back in the 60s. He designed mobile computing for education. This is what he designed with Alan Kay called the Diner Book. And in fact, here's a picture from his 1972 research paper about what classrooms will be like in the future. It's kind of a, a combination of an iPad and a Blackberry kind of all sort of put together. And um, I figured uh, that actually Mobile technology and tablet devices have been around a lot longer than that because I was walking past St Mary's in Hyde Park in Sydney the other day and I took this photo because have a look at the guy down the bottom right hand corner. How's that for tablet devices over 100 years ago? That blew me away. 
But one thing that Seymour Papert said, we're trying to find ways in which technology enables children to use knowledge. What we do know is that they will be everywhere, as much as pencils. How true is that today? Everyone will have them all the time. How true is that today? And yet what do we do in schools? Ban them. You can't have your phone here at school. Who knows who will ring you during class time? And with everyone having computers all the time, it is inconceivable that learning will be like it's been in the past. There will be new ways of learning, but it's up to you and me and all of us to invent that future. That was 30 years ago. And I reflect back on today and think, would Seymour Papert, if he was here today looking at the way we teach, would he be realising his dream and his goal of where learning and where education will be in the future? As I said earlier, I think maybe he, see, he would see some changes now, but it's been taken literally 30 years since that was made. And that's probably a nice statement to sort of finish off this particular presentation with. So thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you doing the next.